So I'm Dave Robertson. I'm a professor of practice here at the Wharton School. Sure, yeah. In terms of uh, a company that I've spent a lot of time with, um, the Lego Group had an amazing failure. Um, a lot of people don't know that in 2003, the company almost went out of business. Um, and the reason they almost went out of business is because they followed the advice of academics and consultants, uh, advice about how to manage innovation. And they, uh, what they did is they, um, they tried to sail for blue ocean and disrupt their current business. And they tried to be customer centric and, and uh, customer driven. Um, they tried to open up innovation. And they did all those things. And it almost put them out of business. Um, and it's because of that failure that they are now one of the most successful companies, not just in the toy industry, but in the world. Um, they've been growing sales at 24% per year for the past four years and profits at 41% per year per the, for the past four years. And the reason why is that what they realized is those, those theories of innovation were all right. You know, we, we should be looking for new markets. We should be trying to disrupt our current business. We should be partnering with outside companies. We should be focused on the needs of our customers. And if you do all that, you can really boost innovation tremendously. Um, but they kind of boosted innovation beyond what they could control, and they almost, you know, crashed and burned. Um, what they did have done since then, in the, uh, the years since the 2003 bankruptcy, they spent a couple of years and they put in a very sophisticated management system, a system of, of governing innovation, of directing it, um, so that they give people not only the space to create, but the direction to deliver profitable innovation. Um, and because of that, you know, since 2007, they've had this incredible growth and success. Um, but it's all because that those, those um, truths about innovation, those seven uh, what I call the deadly truths, were really only half the story. That you can't just give people um, the direction, the, the, the space to create, you also have to give them the direction to deliver. That, that disciplined system, that efficient system on top of it, that makes sure that what they're doing is in line with your strategy and profitable for the organization. You know, I think managing innovation is, um, the, the real challenge is to not use that word and not think about that word. Um, that I, I think now where we're going with innovation, if you look at the way, and I think Wharton has been the leader in pushing this, uh, away from a, a very narrow definition of innovation, the kind that you see in the business press, like, you know, the, the revolutionary great product that changes markets. Um, to a broader definition. You know, we talk here about the full spectrum of innovation. George Day has really spent a lot of time on that. Yeah. If we think about that full spectrum of innovation, and we think about innovation not just as great products, but also services and channels to market and business models and, and internal business processes and customer experiences and all those different types of innovation. Well, now instead of an R&D group doing innovation, We've got the entire company doing innovation. We've got business development people and marketers and salespeople and you know, accountants doing innovation. I mean, that's kind of scary, right? <laughs> um, so setting up a, a system that doesn't manage it but governs it, I think, is the key challenge. Because there's going to be failure everywhere. Um, but managing, setting up a system so that you're getting the right type of innovation, you're coordinating it both within the company and outside the company. Because when you, when you start to build the full spectrum, you're going to have to partner to do that. No company has all the resources or expertise to do that. Um, so setting up that kind of governance system, um, I, I like to liken it to financial governance, that a CFO doesn't sign off on every spending request. But they set up a system to make it very clear who does own that money? How much authority do they have? When do they have to escalate? What are the right policies and procedures? You know, how does that work? So that the, the authority uh, for financial governance, uh, for, for the good management of, of financial resources, is spread around the company in a way that makes sense for the company. We have to do that same thing now for innovation, that it's not enough to just have a good R&D department. We have to have a governance system so all the different parts of the company, when they're doing innovation, are coordinated and directed in the right way. You know, I, I guess I, I kind of have to, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit uh, um, uh, difficult about this. I, I think that failure is overrated. Um, you know, I think often companies, when they 
uh, they go into innovation, they say, well, you know, we've got to fail often to succeed sooner. And, you know, failure is important. And, and yes, that's true. Um, but, you know, what, what, uh, what very good companies find, I think, is that, you know, in, in some parts of your company, you want to actually not fail that much. Um, you want to, you know, there, there's lots of incremental improvements that could be done to existing products where the failure rate should not be that high. Um, whereas in other parts of your company where you are trying to do something really revolutionary or different, you do have to tolerate failure. And you do have to encourage experiments and cheap failures and all the things that we talk about here. Um, but this kind of uh, emphasis on failure um, overall for a company may be misdirected. That, in fact, there are parts of the company where it's like um, a, you know, a financial investment strategy. Um, you know, if you're going to have a, a certain amount of money that you want safe for a rainy day and you're investing in very secure bonds, you know, you don't want those to fail. You know, you want that money when, when the, f the furnace blows up or when you need a new car or something right. like that. You don't want failure there. Where you're experimenting and trying something really new, like, you know, you're investing in risky stocks, well then, you know, you want some home runs and you want some people striking out. And that's okay. Both those are okay. And you want to tolerate failure there. Um, but, you know, as a general rule, I think failure is overrated. Uh, I think uh, in terms of the, um, the knowledge that's needed by decision makers, um, it is uh, to move away from the management of innovation to the governance of innovation. It's all about um, how do we set up a system so that the, the person at the highest level of the company, if they were to leave the company for three months, how do we make sure that innovation continues? You know, I, people often use Steve Jobs and Apple as a model. And I think, you know, I, I want to be careful about this because I, I think that the way it's written about is not the way it's actually done in Apple. Um, but the way it's written about is that you've got this brilliant um, person at the top who's overseeing every innovative product that gets put out to market. Um, I don't think it actually worked that way. I think, you know, Steve, I, Steve Jobs actually did have a very big influence, but it wasn't like that. Um, but having that model of the brilliant person at the top that everything goes through that really drives the company to insanely great products, I think is a real mistake. Um, because I think, uh, number one, finding that person is really tough. Um, promoting them is often difficult. I love the, um, the Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs where uh, they actually found that in one of his early jobs, um, because he had a macrobiotic diet, he felt that he, he didn't actually need to shower. Um, his diet would keep him smelling fresh. And he smelled so bad that they made him work the, the night shift in, uh, in one of his first companies. Well, you know, finding that person, promoting to them to the top, and running all innovation through that person is a pretty risky way to think about innovation. Um, but rather, setting up a, a system that encourages innovation, gives people the space to create and the direction to deliver in all the different parts of the company, and setting it up so that it runs without the input from the management team on a day-to-day -day basis, but they just kind of come in and you know, pull up weeds from the garden rather than kind of are actively there every day. Um, that's the kind of thing that has to happen. It's how, do you, how do you make that a part of the everyday culture and, and processes of the, of the company?